Okay, this is week 18 of popular culture, national holidays. So November 8th is National Cappuccino Day, and a cappuccino is basically an espresso-based coffee drink, and it's extremely popular in Italy, and it's made of equal parts of espresso, steaming milk, and milk foam. November 8th is also National Parents as Teachers Day, and this basically acknowledges the importance of parents as a um, educator in their children's lives, as every child learns their first lessons from their parents, and it's basically to acknowledge them as supporting their child inside and outside of the classroom. Here are some of the holidays that are on November 9th. First one is Chaos Day. Chaos is a word used to describe a time of disorder and confusion. Chaos Day is just a fun holiday in where we recognize the fact that we will always have chaos in our lives at some point. Second one is Flag of Azerbaijan Day. Azerbaijan is a country and the flag of Azerbaijan Day is a holiday where the country just celebrates their flag. The last one is Fried Chicken Sandwich Day. Fried chicken sandwiches are a popular food. It's just a piece of deep fried chicken between bread. And this holiday is celebrated in the US and the purpose is just to appreciate how good fried chicken sandwiches taste. And the holiday on November 10th is Vanilla Cupcake Day. Vanilla cupcakes are single serving cakes that are made by adding vanilla is essence or extract to the cake batter, batter and to the icing or any topping. Cupcakes was named with the World Cup because they were usually baked. They were they were usually baked in cup shaped molds. Originally, they were baked in heavy pottery cups. So, in the U United Kingdom, they are known as fairy cakes. While in some parts of Australia, cupcakes are called patty cakes. So these are some different names that you could call a cupcake. Prefer chocolate cakes instead. I'm sorry. If you prefer chocolate chocolate cupcake, you can just wait for 11 months and you will be able to celebrate Chocolate Cupcake Day on October 18th. So how could you celebrate if you are a cupcake lovers? The first way you can celebrate it is Decor is through decorating some fabulous tasting vanilla cupcakes to share. In addition, you can also invite family and friends to enjoy them or take them to work. Lastly, you can have a cupcake bake-off, which will be really fun. Veterans Day is a federal holiday in the United States observed annually on November 11th for honoring, honoring military veterans, which are people who have served in the United States Armed Forces, and it is a time for us to pay our respects to those who have served. Um, and fun fact, that was actually a day before this was recorded, um, and it reflects upon the heroism of those who died in our country's service and was originally called Armistice Day. Armistice Day recognizes the end of World War I when hostilities ceased on November 11th at 11 a.m. 1918, and that was the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, which is November, and the simple gesture of wearing patriotic colors can pay tribute such as red, white, and blue, which is um, America's flag colors and also a famous quote for veterans day that are that is usually used is honoring all those who served which is also seen um in the veterans day picture that i put and the boots that you see on the right side of the picture represents the veterans who have fought in world war one to serve for our country and sacrifice their life Um, this is November 12th. November 12th has a lot of um, national holidays. So it is first chicken soup for the soul day. And this is basically as shown on the um, left side, right side of the presentation is a brand that publishes inspirational books and movies about inspirational stories that people do for the goodness of their heart. Um, National Donor Sabbath Day is when you um, when to unite the different people of different religions, 
A National Friendship Day is shown below, and it's basically a roast meat sandwich where the meat juices are collected and se served separately as a side dish up to the sandwich. National Happy Hour Day is celebrating happy hour, which is an evening celebration usually on Friday, filled with alcohol. National Pizza with the works except anchovies day is basically pizza without anchovies. And World Pinoma Day it Health is basically to get awareness among people who um, need to stand together and demand action in the fight against this disease. So for November 13th, we have World Kindness Day, which is where people spread kindness to each other. If people are kind, the, the basic idea is that if people are kind, more people are willing to spread kindness. So here's an example. Imagine if you head out for the day and your neighbor's garbage can has tipped over. Instead of ignoring it and letting the wind make a mess, you pick it up and return it to the corner. Three other neighbors notice and give you a smile and a nod on their way to work. Now, one of those neighbors notices a stranded driver on the side of the road on his coming to work. He remembers the thoughtfulness that you did and he offers assistance to this stranded driver. Then several passers take notice and then this would continue as the passengers would do other stuff that would spread kindness. On November 13th, there's also another holiday called National Indian Pudding Day. This is a holiday where people make Indian pudding and they share it with others. This all started in the 17th century where English colonists first brought pudding to North America, transforming it. Although they initially made the pudding with wheat because they had a shortage of grain, the colonists eventually used cornmeal. Since the colonists have learned to cultivate maize, which is corn, from the ind indigenous peoples, the crop was readily available. The colonists derived the name for Indian putty from the name for cornmeal, Indian meal. Okay, so on November 14th, there's a lot of holidays. There's the National Seatbelt Day, which encourages everybody to make sure they wear their seatbelts in the car. Uh, a lot of deaths happen during car accidents because the victims aren't wearing their seatbelts. There's also National Family PJ Day, which is just basically everybody in the family wears their pajamas for the whole day. Um, National Pickle Day just celebrates the food item, the pickle, which is, if you don't know what that is, it's like a cucumber and it's like basted in like a lot of different, uh, different uh, like spices and stuff uh national spicy guacamole day just celebrates uh, another food item the spicy guacamole and then world diabetes day raises awareness for those with diabetes which encourages people to donate or try to help the cause okay thank you so much um for listening Okay, we'll begin history in two minutes.
Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this week's history lesson. This week we'll be finishing up our the Islamic Golden Age chapter. Um, this, we will be talking about the Ottoman Empire and the Safavid dynasty. So here is the brief timeline of the Islamic world during the Middle Ages. Today we'll be talking about things that happened after 1000 AD during the decline of the Abbasid Caliphate and the Ottoman Empire. So the decline of the Abbasid Caliphate. In 1200, the Abbasid Caliphate was a shadow of its former self. Beginning around 1000, Turkish speaking people from Central Asia were brought into this region and they served as slave soldiers within the Abbasid Caliphate. However, as this caliphate declined, they increasingly took political and military power themselves. And in 15, uh, 1055, the Abbasids were overpowered by the Seljuk Turkic Empire, whose ruler began claiming the title, Muslim title of the Sultan instead of the Turkic title of the Khagan. By 1200, former Abbasid territories have already split it into a series of different sultanates ruled by local Persian and Turkish military rulers. And finally, in the 13th century, the Mongols invaded the region and officially ended the Abbasid Caliphate, but they were on the decline for decades before this already. And the Mongols ruled much of Persia for a time after this. Birth of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was a creation of many Turkish warrior groups who moved into Abbasid territories. By the mid 15th century, the Ottoman Turks had created a state that contained much of the Anatolian Peninsula, which for those of you who don't know, is essentially the area that formed the Tigris and the Euphrates, as well as a lot of Turkey. The Ottomans also pushed farther into Christian territories, the Byzantine Empire, and later Southeastern Europe, which includes the Balkans. On May 29th, 1453, the forces of the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II conquered Constantinople, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire. And this marked the final end of the Byzantine Empire, which had lasted for more than 1,000 years. And even today, Constantinople is named Istanbul as the Ottoman capital. The Ottoman Empire reached the peak of its power between the 1480s and the 1560s. In 1517, the Ottomans took control of Mecca and Medina, the holy cities of Islam. And after these conquests, the Ottoman Sultan was seen as the leader of all of Islam. Suleiman I, the, the Sultan from 1520 to 1566, expanded the empire farther. During his reign, the Ottoman Empire stretched from Hungary to the Persian Gulf. Its land also included Egypt and the coast of North Africa. Here you can see the extent of the Ottoman Empire. You can see Anatolia, lots of Egypt, pretty much all of Northern Africa, and lots of the Balkans. Here you can see a squadron of the Imperial Guard of Abdul Hamid II of the Ottoman Empire. And here is the Battle of Lepanto. This is very important where the fleets of Spain, Venice, and the Papal States defeat the Ottoman Turks. And it's the last great sea battle involving the ore driven warships known as galleys. Now, the Ottoman Empire, like all empires, does not last forever. And they began to lose power in the last decades of the 1500s. In 1683, the Ottoman Empire failed in an attempt to capture the city of Vienna in Austria. Um, fun fact about this battle this battle would be literally the turning point of the century and would lead to the Ottoman collapse. And the Ottoman lost a great deal of territory as a result. And so by the 1800s, Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe. By World War I, 1914 to 1918, the empire fought with Germany on the losing side. And with its defeat, the, a group of young Turks under leader Ataturk formed the new country of Turkey, Safavid Persia. The white sheep and black sheep. During the period from the 15th century to the early 16th century, black sheep and white sheep competed for supremacy in the west of Iran. So it's important to know that white sheep and black sheep aren't literal. They aren't literal sheep. They're nicknames for dynasties. Uh, basically, this was a battle between Timur descendants in the Middle East, and Uzbeks in Central Asia began to expand gradually. And this was before the birth of Safavid Persia. 
During the medieval times in the Middle East, the nations and tribal lines of higher social forms of Amphiophman tribes invaded the Persian region with lower development forms, breaking the tribes composed of backward Persian clans. By um, ruling by force, they created legitimacy in a form of religion, and both the white sheep and black sheep dynasty uh, used um, different, I mean, they used the same religion, but it's called different sects. So uh, while the white sheep dynasty believed in Sunni Islam, the, white, uh, the black sheep dynasty believed in Shia Islam. The white sheep dynasty ruled from 1378 to 1508, and it was ruled by Turkmen in the north of Iraq. Uh, after Timur conquered Diyarbakir in 1402, due to Osman's bravery in a previous battle, Timur gave him uh, the entire territory. By 1408, Osman would announce his succession from the Timur Empire, and it was replaced by the Safavid dynasty. The black sheep dynasty was from 1375 to 1468. And it ruled over modern day territories, including Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, northern, northwestern Iran, and Armenia. It was destroyed by the White Sheep Dynasty. The Safavid Dynasty is a dynasty that ruled over modern day Iran and sustained one of the longest running empires of Iranian history for over 235 years. There is known for the establishment of the Twelver is Shiism, the largest branch of Shia Islam as the official religion of the dynasty. And Shah Ismail founded the Safavid dynasty um, and joined, the bo joined both halves of the Iranian plateau, which is broken up into many autonomous states through military achievement. The Safavids claimed uh, descent from uh, Muhammad's family through his son-in-law, Ali, uh, they split Persia from Sunni Islam, the religion of Ottomans, and established Shia Islam as the state uh, religion. Under uh, Shah Abbas uh, ruled 1588 uh, to 1629, the greatest of Safavid um, dynasty, um, Persia reached a golden age. Art, miniature painting, carpets, uh, tape, uh, tapestries, uh, metalwork, and architecture flourished during his reign. Uh, Isfahan. The new capital was um, embellished with gardens and a great palace, the whole of 40 columns. Um, the Safavids um, held off the powerful Ottoman Turks. Um, however, Esfahan fell in 1722 to Af uh, Afghanistan tribe tribesmen. Um, the Safavid um, dynasty ended in 1736 when Nader Shah Afshar ruled 1736 to 1747, uh, seized the throne, uh, which means um, this guy became the king or the caliph. Um, one of the Persia's greatest military leaders, um, he, f as, uh, one of, uh, he f freed the country from the Afghans, uh, Turks and, Russia's, uh, and Russians and invaded India. His brief rule was followed by the Zen dynasty, 1750 to uh, 1779, and the Qatar rulers, um, 1778 to 1925. And that is the end of today. Next up is the science lesson. Thank you, history. We will break a few minutes for the science to start.
Okay, biology group, we'll start now. So for biology this week, we're gonna be focusing on ecosystems. So for the first ecosystem, it's a tundra ecosystem. And the tundra ecosystem basically consists of a treeless regions and high mountains. And the vegetation and scenery is low growing and consists of grasses, dwarf shrubs, and wildflowers. The climate is often cold and often extremely snowy in the winter as seen on the left. And the global warming will, will have the greatest effect on the tundra. And they have a variety of animals which annually uh, migrate to the Arctic and annually means yearly. So animals in the tundra live in the, have to be able to adapt to cold winter temperatures and they raise their babies in the short summer months. Some animals that live in the tundra are the Arctic hare, the polar bear, the caribou, and the snowy owl. Animals such as the caribou migrate to the warmer climates in the winter, and the Arctic ground squirrel will hibernate during the winter months. And lastly, some fun facts about the tundra. Animals which live in the tundra have small ears and tails. This helps them lose less heat in the cold. They also have large feet to help them walk in the snow. The tundra has long dry winters which feature total darkness and frigid temperatures and indigenous people will live in these ecosystems. The tundra plays a large role in the temperature regulation of the planet. Okay, next is the forest ecosystem. So the forest ecosystem consists of a lot of trees bundled together in like a group. It's in, it could be as small as 25 acres or as big as like multiple states like, to, to gather, yeah. And then forests are, not, are the natural homes to many wildlife, birds, insects, flower, and flowering plants. And then they also contribute much to the present world by like, producing like fresh air and like wood for like humans. And then, and then also forest ecosystems are composed of biotic and abiotic components. Biotic means living things like birds, foxes, and humans, while abiotic means physical but not living things like water and fire. Next slide. Go on the next slide. Okay. Okay. Can you go back two slides? That are not one. Oh, hi, Jasmine. Uh, can you go back to slide, please? It's uh, I think last person still have some slides. Yeah. And the slide after that, uh, Jasmine. Can you go to the next slide? Oh yeah, okay. Now we'll, now we'll talk about animals in the forest. So the forest houses many different animals of all shapes and sizes from its small animals like birds, like woodpeckers to like big animals like big grizzly. There are actually four different layers of forest for and animals to live in. And the top layer is a tree layer which helps put, protect small flying animals like birds from bigger prey on the ground. And then the next layer is, is a shrub layer, which have many thorns, which protect the birds from like, an, animals of prey, and also helps protect deer from bad weather and animals of prey. And then the layer after that is the herbaceous layer or the plant layer, which provide insects pr pr protection and food. And then the most, and then the bottom layer is the forest floor, where the rest of the animals who can't fly live, like bears. Yeah. Next slide. Some fun facts about the forest. Is, so the first one is that the 
forests are usually named after their types of trees. For example, broadleaf forests have elms, willows, alder trees, and birches, which are all types of broadleaf. And then the conifer forests have pine and spruces, which are also types of conifer. And then the mixed forest consists of mix of broadleaf and conifer forest. Yeah. And then forests can also be named after their geographic location or climate. And then 32% of German of Germany's land surface is covered by forest, and then 80% of the sunlight is filtered by the leaves of the trees. Yeah. Uh, next, I'm going to talk, talk about marine ecosystem. Um, in an ecosystem, every organism plays an important role, even if it's the smallest fungi or bacteria. And um, it's uh, an ecosystem on the land is very similar to that of ecosystem in water, just um, just composed of biotic and abiotic factors, as you can see in these pictures. Um, next slide, please. And. Marine ecosystem are the uh, largest largest aquatic ecosystem in ecosystem in water, and it exists in water that has high salt content. One of the most important organisms living in ocean is coral. Next slide, please. And coral reefs protect coastlines from storm and erosion provide jobs for local communities and offer opportunities for real recreation. They're also a source of food and new medicine. And over half a billion people depend on reefs for food, income, and protection. And as you can see on the left, um, some fishes, some, some fish living inside the coral for protection as their home. And we humans depend, de depend on them as a food source and recreation and so many other purposes. So, Coral could be considered the most important organism in a marine ecosystem, and that is. Thank you, biology group. The chemistry group will start in a few minutes.
Okay, the chemistry group will start now. I can share the screen if you are not convenient. Yeah, can you share? Thanks. Yes. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about thermodynamics, heat chemistry, basically. First thing we're going to talk about is an equation. So Q equals M times C times T. This T will see either capitalized or lowercase. This is basically called the heat equation. Q is the heat, right? M is the mass of the material, preferably in kilograms. And then C is the specific heat of the equation. This is a number that will be given to you. And T is the change in temperature. So basically using this heat equation, we will be trying to figure out the change in heat after a period of time where the temperature has changed from a certain value to another value. Right, the next we're going to be talking about enthalpy. Enthalpy is the measure of the total heat present in the thermodynamic system. It's the sum of the system's internal energy and product of pressure and volume. As you get more into advanced chemistry, you'll find out there's a very close relationship between enthalpy H and heat from the previous equation Q. So as heat energy will go into the system from the surrounding. So basically, if you were to have a heater, right? Outside is the surrounding, and then the inside is the system. So heat from the outside will go inside. This is when enthalpy will increase. And then when the heat of the inside goes outside, that's when enthalpy decreases. Okay, now um, entropy refers to the measure of the level of disorder in a thero thermodynamic system. Um, the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of a closed system is always increasing. So the difference between enthalpy and entropy is that enthalpy is donated by H, which refers to the measure of total heat content in a thermodynamic system under constant pressure. While entropy refers to um, the measure of the level of disorder in a thermodynamic system. Okay, thank you for listening. This is our today's lesson.